Welcome to Bible study. Let's get started. Thank you for being here. Uh, just a side note, next week is Thanksgiving. If you haven't gotten your turkey already, chop, chop. With the turkey. Chop, chop with the turkey. Get it on. Uh, we will not have Bible study next week, so uh, we generally have people kind of spread all over on that Wednesday and Thursday, so no Bible study next week. We will see you the week after, uh, but we will see you this weekend for Sunday service, so don't just run off to Never Never Land or skip church as some of you are want to do. I just, I just threw that out there just randomly. It is the faithful. God bless the faithful. And to those who are online, many blessings to you as well. Pull it together. All right. Uh, any other announcements that I'm missing? Somebody else? Nope. All right. I uh, want to pray for uh, Steve Picard tonight. Uh, some pretty severe congestion and uh, just not doing well and uh, kind of suffered through the week so far. Let's ask the Lord to give him some strength and clear up his congestion. I also pray for Sally Peterson, who is recovering from a pretty uh, dramatic routine procedure. Uh, you know how sometimes those procedures go awry, and uh, she's trying to get back to, to regular and Sally doesn't like to sit. She is, like some of us, impatient with the process. And so she would like it to go quicker than it's going. So I ask you to pray for her as well. Uh, somebody else have a, a request you need to pray about tonight? Yes, Christina. Let's pray for Christine's mom suffering from COVID tonight. Somebody else? Yes, Jesse. Pray for Jesse's co-worker who's having a difficult family situation tonight. Let's pray. Carol Lucas, thank you. Yes. Uh, Carol's been hospitalized and is back home, but still has a little ways to go. Let's pray for her. All right, stand with me tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Take some of these needs to him right now. Lord Jesus, we ask you for your help and mercy in our lives, and we call on you, Lord, to be a part of this night. Lord, to be a part of our lives. We're grateful for your touch today. I ask you, Lord, to be with Christine's mom. You see the infection in her body. Lord, we ask you to seal up this virus. Lord, let it be removed from her. Let freedom come to her in the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask you to be with Sally Peterson right now and uh, Carol Lucas, who are recovering. I ask you, Lord, to strengthen their bodies. Lord, give peace to their spirits right now. Lord, we commit Steve Picard into your hands. Lord, I ask you to dry up the infection, the congestion in his body. Lord, let him breathe easily, breathe deeply. Lord, let strength come to him right now. I thank you, Lord, for doing what is good and perfect for him. Lord, we commit this co-worker into your hands. You see what is going on in her family. Lord, we pray that you would let peace come to this household. Lord, let your strength and understanding, your grace come to them. We commit them into your love and mercy right now in Jesus' name. Thank you for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We're starting, uh, we're working through in series three, uh, talking about the Psalms. Tonight we're going to be hitting Psalms 22 or 23, and next week we will not have class, but we'll cover Psalms 51 and Psalms 150 uh, the week after. And so we're just working through the songbook of the scriptures. Tonight, looking at 
the Lord being our shepherd. And aren't you thankful that he is? Amen. Amen. Uh, our lesson text is going to be out of Psalms 23. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. Uh, you've got a lesson here. If you're here live with us, you've got a lesson leaflet there talking about the, the life of the shepherd and the effort that the shepherd has to go through in order to reach uh, each one of his sheep. And the, the shepherd's life is not one of relaxation. It's not one of um, rest, but it is a 24-7 position. You're out in the field in this culture at that time all the time with your flock, with your herd. And you're constantly looking for the, uh, the injured. You're constantly checking to see which one's limping, which one's not uh, uh, acting the way that the rest of the herd, the rest of the flock is, is acting. And you're also looking for, in, their, in, in that time, you're watching for predators on the regular, all night long. There's somebody who is standing guard, standing watch over that flock. And so our, in, in our uh, study of the scriptures, uh, I think probably the most familiar shepherds to us besides David are the ones in Matthew and uh, the, the uh, angels coming to the shepherds to declare the birth of the Messiah. And we know that they were keeping watch over their flocks by night. These guys were up. I don't know if they were uh, playing some sort of a game like Uno just to keep the time going, or if they were sleeping in shifts. Maybe they had a nice fire. Uh, maybe somebody was wandering the, the hillside to make sure that nothing was coming around them. But these guys were engaged in their job. When, of course, the heavens split open and they had a whole new perspective on life. I want to focus for a little bit before we get uh, into Psalms 23 on what is called the shepherd's psalms. It's 22, 23, and 24. And if you've never read all three of these psalms together, I encourage you to do it. Um, psalms 22, of course is David expressing his feelings of abandonment by God. And uh, Gabe's going to help me out. If you have your scripture, you can pull that up yourself. 22 and 1 is a very familiar verse in the life of Jesus. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Of course, those being the uh, the response or the, 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 the call of Jesus on the cross in Matthew 27. Then he goes on to say, I cry in the daytime, you hear not. Verse 3, uh, you are holy, and our fathers trusted in you. They cried to you. I'm a worm. I'm no man. I'm a reproach. They laugh at me. They shoot the lip. They, they make a, a, a hymn shake their heads and say, he trusted in the Lord. This is verse 8. That he would deliver him. Let him deliver him and see if he delights in him. But you are him who took me out of the womb and did make my hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I cast upon me from the womb. I, 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 I was from the beginning. I have uh, been with you. And he goes on in 11, 12, and 13 and then in 14, he says, I've poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted within the midst of my bowels. And this is what is happening in the physical, in the crucifixion. The heart would literally burst from the, um, the, exerta the, the, the um, um, exertion, thank you, of, uh, of the experience of that crucifixion. And I use experience in a very... Um, it's an understatement. My strength is dried up like a pot shard. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. 
and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Remember, he says, I thirst. And they brought him some gall to drink or some vinegar. For dogs have come past about me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I, might, I tell all my bones, uh, and they look upon me. And another translation says, I've counted. I've taken inventory of my bones. I can see them. Uh, they part my, ve- my garments among them, cast lots upon my vesture. But be now far from me, O Lord, my strength. I have you to help me. And then he finishes off. So, so 22 finishes that call of abandonment. And then 23 forward is a worship talking about who God is and his praise for him and how he satisfies him throughout his life. This is 22. So we have the good shepherd because this is what John 10 and 11 says. He said, I'm the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. This is Jesus, the Savior on the cross. David, yes, saying this from his perspective that he is feeling abandoned, but it was a prophetic that he was sharing with him, uh, with, with his reader, with those who are singing the song. One, one commentator said, you can't say, you can't read chapter 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want until you have said the Lord is my Savior in verse in chapter 22. You can't say, I know who he is and he supplied my needs until you have experienced what happened on the cross in chapter 22. So in 23, we talk about the great shepherd, and we're going to talk about this more in just a little bit. But uh, in 24, we see him revealed as the great shepherd. So let's go to 24. We'll come back to 23 in just a second. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell within. For he founded upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend unto the Lord, the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He has clean hands, a pure heart. He's not lifted up his soul to vanity or sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord. And this is the generation that seeks you. O uh, uh, seeks thy face. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up ever, your everlasting doors. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. So we go from the crucifixion, we crow from the Savior, we go to the provision that happens in 23, and then we have this worship of who God is in the shepherd. Uh, in, in 1 Peter 5 and 4, it says, when the chief shepherd appears, Peter says, you're going to receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. And we see that in verse 10. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. You can't have all of this together and at the end of this not say, man, I'm so thankful for the Lord in my life. I'm so thankful for what he has done for me. So let's look at Psalms 23. In uh, Hebrews 13, verse 20 and 21, it says, Now the, may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, uh, we see here Jesus who is our strength and our provider. So I want to read through, and you can quote it. Uh, close your eyes so you don't cheat off the screen, however you want to do. But let's read through. Psalms 23. Are you ready? Can you do it with your eyes closed? Ah. (laughs) The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hallelujah. You know, we we hear this, Psalm 23, we hear it often in... Uh, funerals. It's uh, it's of course we've got the valley of death, 
We've got uh, some comfort that's going on. But it wasn't until uh, the early 1900s that that really got incorporated into funeral experiences for Christianity. If, if you go back into the prayer books of the early denominations uh, that were given to ministers, before ni- like uh, ni- before the 1920s even, there was no um, Psalm 23 in the funeral scripture listing. Uh, now, in the Hebrew, it was it's used quite often in a uh, in a funeral experience, and even uh, during the Shabbat, we've talked about Shabbat in the past, but it's traditionally sung as a song during the, the Shab- one of the Shabbat meals, and so it was very familiar with the Jewish community, but not so much. Uh, with the Christian community as it relates to a funeral experience. Now, of course, it's been sung for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. There's been, well, thousands. It was it was written as a song. Uh, but it was as far as modern, I want to say modern, um, lyricists and uh, arrangers, Psalms 23 has been very familiar to us. And so we're going to ca- go through this talking through the love of God in action. And we all know that actions speak louder than words, and this is a perfect example of the actions that God takes for us to supply our needs. There's a flip side to this, and we're not going to get delve too deeply into it, but if you look at 22, 23, and 24 as a messianic uh, prophecy, then you can look at Psalms 23 as the Lord's, uh, Jesus, the man, being on the cross, going through uh, the valley of death and knowing that on the other side, I've got resurrection. On the other side, I've got rest for my soul, uh, for, for my body. And that goodness and mercy that's coming uh, to me, uh, I'm going to be at the, in the throne room of the house of the Lord. But we're going to focus on this as it relates to us as the believer. Uh, has anybody dealt with sheep? Nobody? Has anybody had sheep recently? A lamb? You've had mutton? No? Goat? Goat's milk? Goat cheese? Are going to have some goat cheese in the fridge? Well, maybe not. You're going to have to make a run to Aldi. Uh, I think I just burned through it all. Uh, say it again. I, I just cut all mine down. Yes, lambs ear plants, right. Okay. Um, one of the things that we ex- experienced that I, was a, it, I didn't think that it was, that I didn't even translate that this was going to happen. And when we lived overseas in, in the Middle East, there are goats everywhere. And to, to an extent also uh, sheep as well. And so you get to experience that shepherd lifestyle because the Bedouins are just part and parcel of the Jordanian culture. Uh, The Jordanians were uh, Bedouins before they were anything else. So there are goats and herds and flocks everywhere. It was nothing to get up in the morning and there be a a shepherd bringing a flock down the street to to camp out in the... the, the, uh, empty lot next door to our house. Uh, and it was just part of life to be on the highway, and there's a flock, of, a, there's a whole herd of goats munching out on the side on the, the, the side of the road. They are uh, smelly. They are invasive. Um, and it requires a lot of effort to get them to go to wherever they're going to go. It was always uh, fun to watch the guy running around, and if he had another animal, like a, a dog or something like that, generally they, they don't have very many uh, dogs to, to do that kind of work in that culture. Um, but whenever Jesus says in Matthew nine thirty six that he saw the multitudes and was moved com- to compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like a sheep having no shepherd, it's absolutely the case. Very easily, very quickly, that flock just kind of 
like a spilt milk all over the counter headed toward the edge. And we are very much the same. Very easily we can wander ourselves away. And this is this compassion that Jesus was moved by is what moves him from a passive uh, observation of the situation to action. He's moved with compassion, going to do something. And so I'm going to show you how I love you and how I'm involved in your life in a very tangible kind of way. You're not going to wander aimlessly through life. I'm going to engage with you. And, of course, the Gospels are filled with demonstrations of of the Lord doing incredible things, healing the sick, raising the dead, uh, opening deaf ears and blind eyes. And, of course, the most impressive of all was that he died, buried, and rose again. And there's nobody that's done anything like that. And all those under, all those uh, actions, all those activities, all those, those bullet points were to show one specific goal, and that was love. Love for us and love for who he wants us to be. The shepherd is not uh, passive in his action toward the sheep, but it is a constant engagement with his flock. We have to be able to take the word of the Lord at its face value. So whenever Jesus compared himself to a shepherd, he was saying, I'm going to make you a promise. I'm going to nourish you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to provide for you and do exactly the same that you have seen a shepherd doing. And some of you are shepherds. I'm going to do exactly the same thing for you uh, as you would do for your sheep. We can expect that the Lord's going to do the same for us today. David was pretty well equipped to speak about this because of his past. It's possible that he wrote Psalms 23 uh, later in life. Uh, It's possible that he, um, whenever he was writing, I've been young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken, that he's writing it around the same time that he's writing that same that same scripture. And so whenever he says to he's thinking about think about David thinking about the blessings of God and thinking about his life and looking back over years that the Lord has blessed him. And have you ever felt this way whenever you're thinking about the Lord and you say you you feel some emotion that wells up inside of you and you think, wow, man, God's been really good to me. And then you put a post out on Facebook that says, this is what God's done in my life. And I'm so thankful. I just want to testify. Or, or you, uh, you know, you're, you're worshiping in, a, in, in service and there's some, suddenly some emotion that comes out of you. It's possible that David felt that same emotion whenever he says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Difficult times? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, did he have some faults of his own? Without question. And which one of us do not? But the Lord consistently manifested himself in David's life as the blessing and as the one who chased him like a sheepdog chasing after with goodness and mercy. Verse 23 and 1. Now let's take this one by one. I'm not going to lack. The phrase in the King James is future tense. I shall not want. It's not past tense as in a testimony of what God has done, but it is the future tense. I shall not want. So David is saying, I see what God has done in my life, but I know based on my experience that going forward, he's still going to meet my needs. I have an ongoing relationship with confidence. There has been no deficiency in the past, and thus I know by faith that the Lord is going to continue to meet my needs. Aren't you thankful today that the Lord cares for us on the daily? Some of us are the show up in worship types, uh, or we know people who are like that, 
and who disappear for eons and then reappear. And we're here to worship the Lord. Well, have you been worshiping him all this time that you haven't been around to worship the Lord? Oh, God's good. Deflection, deflection. David, like some of us, has had the Lord daily load us down with benefits. Daily load us down with benefits. He knows what is best for us. I, out of curiosity, has anybody had a, a, a daily loaded down with benefits experience where you're like, this is just such a God moment? Jonathan raises his hand. Hashtag Wendy's. Let the record show that there's some goading in the audi- in the audience. There was a connection that was made just now. For those who don't know, Jonathan has spent an inordinate amount of time at our newest fast food establishment, Wendy's. Hashtag blessed. Somebody else. Perhaps I shall move on. I think Jonathan's was real. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Some of you are very familiar with this song, but I just I want to make some notes here as we go. The the laying down portion, I'm going to come back to that in in verse five. But a a sh- a, a sheep does not eat sitting down or laying down. It eats standing up. And so if you're laying down in a green pasture, it means you're full. So you've already had your fill, and there's still plenty more around you. So when you get hungry in the middle of the night, you just stand up and munch and lay back down. Nice. He leads me beside the still waters. Some of you are aware a, 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 a sheep will not drink from a moving stream a river it's scared of it it's it's spooky you know ooh, nervous so it has to be still waters so i'm finding still waters for you he restores my soul he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake how many of you have had your soul restored where you were just so broken and the lord poured in some restoration into your life, and you said, oh, man, I I was lost. I had wandered off. I'd gotten stuck in the thicket, or I was being chased, or I'd had a, some really bad food, or whatever it was that was messing with you. And the, the Lord pursued you and restored you. I'm very thankful. His perfection does not equate to our perfection because we are very imperfect people. We have a goal for righteousness to be like he is, but none of us are going to be able to say that we have achieved perfection. In the moment you say it, you have it. So our tendencies like sheep to be stubborn, to think we know what's best, to go our own way, to literally kick against the shepherd. He's picking us up in order to save us from our own uh, demise, what we are choosing to do. And when he's like, oh, come back here. And you're like, that's the closest sheep I'm going to get from this. And you're kicking and flailing, and those legs, all four of them are going everywhere. We often have, the, the at least I do, this vision of the shepherd carrying the, the sheep over his shoulders, and the sheep's just like, hey, I'm just chilling with the shepherd. That is not the case. That sheep has no desire to be elevated that far off the ground. So it's, it's, a, it's a hog tie action to get that sheep to do that. We are not exactly, the the leg is broken. And so in order for us to be in a position of, of righteousness, 
Yes, there's some free will on our side, but aren't you thankful that he's merciful and continues to beckon and call us and get us into a, a loving re- relationship? Leads me to the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Oh, we are so limited in what we know and what we do. Uh, all right, let me see what my notes are here. Here we go. Proverbs 14, 12. There's a path that seems right unto a man, and it is the end of death. Sobering, sobering thought. And yet, so much of us are trying to – give me a bigger desk up here. So much of us are trying to figure out our own path and find our own ways. Proverbs 3 and 6, acknowledge him in all your ways. He's going to direct your paths. Keep your eye on the good shepherd. Let him find your way. We're going to take a break and, and go to a video real quick and talk about the, God, the blessings of the Lord in our lives and what he's protected us from. Gabe, go ahead. When I think of God's protection, my mind automatically goes to Job 1 and 10. Right after the Lord asked the enemy if he had ever considered a servant Job, he asked the Lord a question and said, Have Job feared you for not? Have you not placed a hedge around him? You know, when I look into that, hedge there in the meaning there in the book of Job. Historians say in the days of Job, they didn't really have walls they put around their homes, and their biggest thing they were worried about was wild animals, not so much even other humans. And so they would take hedges with thorns, and they would grow them close together around their home, primarily to keep out wild animals. And I thought, the Bible likens the devil to a roaring lion, and so the hedge that Job would have had around his physical home would be to keep out lions. But there was also a spiritual hedge that the devil could not get through in order to attack Job and his family and his finances that God had to allow him through that hedge. And, you know, I look at my life and and I see a similar hedge in my life. I I think first, even looking back before I was born, my father was born the son of an alcoholic. And at a young age, he became an alcoholic and his father passed away when he was just a teenager. And his whole family told my dad, you're going to be an alcoholic and die just like your dad died. And that's all my dad ever heard is that he was going to be an alcoholic. And and my dad and mom got married and went to the country of Liberia. My dad actually went there to party, you know, alcohol and drugs and various things that were available. He wound up getting saved. And one night at a Pentecostal church, God took away drinking from him and he became a missionary and a pastor. So instead of being raised in the home of an alcoholic, I was raised in the home of a pastor. And I think how different my life was. You know what studies have shown if my dad had remained in the world and been an alcoholic with my parents, marriage have made it and my home life would have been different. And I look at the hedge that came around my father when he became saved, that raised in a godly apostolic home and now with my children and grandchildren being raised also in that same environment. So the hedge that my dad placed around his life back in 1972 when he got saved It's still around me today in 2021 because he made a choice to leave the world and become a part of the kingdom of God. And that hedge has protected him, my siblings, my family, myself, my children, and my grandchildren now. I'm going to live my life behind that hedge. I'm going to live my life that please God. I'm going to live my life thanking God, live my life trusting God, because I know a server God who makes a way out of no way, but also keeps me out of harm way. Well, let's just thank God for his protection. Let's thank him for the hedge. Let's thank him for his hand that's upon us that keeps us from danger seen and unseen and many times we don't even know about. Thank you very much. Jesus, let's do that right now. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your protection, safekeeping. Lord, we thank you for a hedge of protection around about us. Lord, we don't deserve your protection, but you have given it. You have surrounded us with your blood, covered us, Lord. You have kept us from a multitude of disasters. You have protected us in our minds, our bodies, our spirits, Lord Jesus. We thank you for him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. This is why it is so good for you to pray 
uh, not only for physical protection, but also spiritual protection. I'm, th I'm thinking when he's talking about the, the hedge, uh, the helmet of salvation, uh, that the Lord would protect your mind uh, and protect what is in you, uh, the breastplate of righteousness, obviously, uh, protecting your spirit, but praying that over yourself. Uh, I know that there are some who say, well, you should never, you shouldn't put it on because you should never take it off, the, hel the, the, the armor of, of salvation. Uh, but if that's the case, then Paul was wasting his time by asking for forgiveness on a daily. Uh, so if you're if you're praying, Lord, if you're praying Psalms 51, then you should be also praying, Lord, I'm, I'm asking you to, to, to make secure my helmet of salvation. Secure me. Lord, protect me from the, the, the wickedness of this evil day. Amen. Uh, think about this. Uh, and you may have just done this in, in, in the, the, the praying that you were just doing. What has the Lord protected you from? Uh, this this uh, one of the, our writers in the curriculum was talking about his his family history and what the Lord. He never experienced what his father had experienced in life because of the, the protection of the Lord. Um, what have you been protected from? What has the Lord kept you from, either kept you from or brought you out of? Or what has, uh, just in, in a moment, where all you get to say is Jesus, that the Lord has kept you and brought you through or brought you from, or s uh, stopped some, some chaos from happening in your life? So now we're in verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. I heard a minister say that crossing over into eternity, it does not matter if he is surrounded by family or if he is alone physically in the room. He knows already that he has someone with him to go through the valley of the shadow of death. Because if you have the Lord with you as your shepherd now, Whenever it's time for you to cross over, you're walking through that valley of death. And, and so many times we, th we think about that death is, is not imminent, but it's possible. And so I walk past death. His perspective was death is imminent, and I'm going through that valley. The Lord is already with me. I'm going to have comfort in that time because he's my shepherd. Some of the translations say the darkest valley, not just the valley of the shadow of death, but I go through the darkest valley. And some of us have experienced some dark, dark valleys in our lives. And it seems like that there are just evil forces that are closing in around us. And the hedge is getting closer and closer because the pressure of the world is pushing against us. Maybe whenever David wrote this because he wrote it in the present tense. Uh, if he uses verse um, 1 in the, in the future tense, he's saying, yea, though I walk, this is now, I'll fear no evil. Maybe there was something going on in his life. It doesn't matter where I am, I'm still not going to fear because I know the Lord is with me and his rod and staff are comforting me. In Philippians 4.19, some of you can quote this verbatim. The Lord's going to supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Paul confidently writing this in a jail cell. In a jail cell, he's saying, all of my needs are going to be supplied. One guy said that Paul knew that even though he, uh, that even if he did not have everything he wanted, he would always have everything he needed. I don't have everything I want, but I have everything I need. After many years of serving the Lord, Paul could sit in that cell writing to the church in Philippi and, 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 and have confidence in God, knowing that today my needs are supplied. Whatever I need for this day, whether it's simply the grace to get through it, I'm going to have it. No, I didn't get my filet mignon today. That's what I wanted. But I did have the grace to survive 
this day. And that's all I needed. Now we have the table in the presence of my enemies. There were times because the sheep would stand would eat standing up that the the shepherd would create a, a, an, a raised station, kind of like a trough, for them to eat from, a table. And often where they were eating was in a, uh, in a dangerous place. Because, and I didn't know this until I, still, until I started doing some research on this, many of the areas uh, that, they were, that the, the, the sheep were in, there were snakes, there were they were hidden in holes. They were, uh, of course, there were every other kind of, of predator, whether it was a, a lion, tigers, or bears, oh my. But the, the, the sheep are literally eating with the predators all around them. Because it wasn't like, like, I don't know, has anybody heard the coyotes howling out here in the parking lot? A few of you shake your heads. Um, there was a night, I was, it's been a, uh, probably over the summer, I was here in the parking lot, and a coyote went running across the beans behind us. And I'm like, that's a little too close. Like, you want to think that you're like, you know, we've got Rail West across the street, you know, we've got Bratchers right down the way, and there's a coyote running through the back of the parking lot. And when you hear them howling, and that, yip, 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 it's just like, whoa, there's more than one of them out there. And I don't want to engage with any of them. Literally, the predators are all around them in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. In the presence of my enemies, my cup still runs over. In, the, in, the, uh, in, in caring for sheep, there's a thing called the back line. And um, after you've sheared the sheep, the skin is then very uh, susceptible to parasites and lice and these kinds of things. And so they will put along the, 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 the back, they'll put a, uh, in, in this case, oil or some type of uh, a salve that would protect the uh, skin of the sheep until they were able to grow that fur, that, the, the wool, thank you, back. And so... When he says, you anoint my head with oil, uh, some people say that the, the, uh, if, if a snake was going to try to bite at the, at, the, uh, at the sheep, the oil on the head and the body would, would deflect that or would, would, would keep that from happening. I don't know that. I haven't seen a scientific uh, study on that. But even today, the, uh, the shepherds are using the same concept of anointing that lamb or that sheep with some type of salve to protect it, to keep it. I have to say, whether it is, uh, w whatever the reason was, the whole point of this anointing was to protect the investment of the shepherd. The investment of the shepherd was in the life of that animal. Do you know whenever the Lord fills you with his spirit, which is the anointing that we talk about in the spiritual of the oil, he is investing in you into your life. It is his investment, a precious investment that is happening in your life. That anointing that happens in your spirit that comes upon you when you are filled with the Holy Spirit is that pouring on of your life, his precious oil of anointing, that investment in our lives causes us, our cup, to run over. I might be stretching a little bit for some of you tonight, but whenever David looked around and looked at what he had been given, that shepherd boy way out in the middle of nowhere, being anointed as king, being the crowned king of Israel and having victory after victory, becoming wealthy beyond his imagination, he could look around himself and say, my cup runs over. As an, an apostolic believer being filled with the Holy Spirit, 
we can look around the future of our lives and say, our cup runs over spiritually. What we are given access through, to through the gifts of the Spirit in our lives, what we are given access to in the power of his Spirit, our cup literally runs over through the power of his word going through us. Of course, when we talk about cups running over, I'm drinking from the springs of living water. And counting my blessings, count them one by one. And all those great heritage songs that we've tried, or that, that, that we sing. And I'm, I'm going to encourage you as we go into the Thanksgiving week next week to s take an exercise of gratitude and try to write down some blessings for yourself. Uh, whether you post it out to social media or you just tuck it away in your in your your Bible someplace or it goes onto the Mark and White board on your refrigerator, whatever that looks like, take a moment or take some time and do some thankfulness stuff to talk about when your cup ran over. One of the things that we do in our family every Thanksgiving, and my, my wife is, is great about this, is uh, we have these, these little um, this string that goes up in these little clips, and you, every day you write down a little something that you're thankful for. And it goes, it spans the spectrum. I'm thankful for Jesus, or I'm thankful for chocolate chip cookies, or whatever you're thankful for. It's good for you to exercise an attitude of gratitude. Obviously not just, you know, the fourth week of, thank of, of November, but it's good for us to be reminded of God's blessings in our lives and just try to count all the blessings in your life. Now, I love the goodness and mercy verse of six because if you've heard me preach the sermon, that shall follow is actually a pursuit. It's a aggressive verb. Goodness and mercy pursues me all the days of my life. And that pursuit, you can say it is an aggressive goodness of God. James 1 and 17 says that every good and perfect gift is from above and it comes down from the Father of lights. James recognized what kind of goodness he had access to. He knew what he had experienced, the constant presence of God's goodness in our lives. The word mercy there translates in uh, one translation to faithfulness, and the New Living Translation, it translates to unfailing love. And all of these words, whatever translation you use, boils down to God's really concerned about us, really concerned about us. So he wraps up uh, the, the 23rd Psalm, and I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I, I, I don't know that, that he, he was physically going to go down to the tabernacle and set up a little uh, pup tent you know, next to the brazen altar, or the labor of washing or whatever. But whenever he's saying this, he's saying, I want to live, I want to exist constantly in the presence of God. David understood the, the, the shepherd's perspective. And his perspective was, I want to constantly be seeking God's presence whenever and wherever I can be. You know, home is a, is a very specific term. Um, you can have a house, we've heard it said, but it's the people that make a home, or it's the family that creates the home, or it's the, you know, the turkey in the oven, or whatever, you know, whatever you want to use. It's a building until there's memories made in it, or there's some kind of existence in it. There's a comfort, there's a safety there's a refuge experience in a home. And so whenever he's saying, I want to dwell in the home, in the house of the Lord, I want to be uh, so close to him that I know I'm safe, I have security, my provision is nowhere else but at home. 
I, I have a, uh, I heard a guy say one time he was building a house for his family. He said, I want to build a house that my kids don't want to go anywhere else. They just want to be here. That's the one the kind of house I want to build. The kind of house that the Lord has built for us, there's no reason to go anywhere else. He's already created everything that we need. He's already provided it for us. So as we wrap this up, I, I, I've already encouraged you to, to, to set up a, a a goal to recognize what the presence of the Lord looks like in blessings, but also in your daily life. The The shepherd was comfortable eating and sleeping and, and living in the field with the sheep, and that's exactly the way the Lord wants to be with us. It's not just a come in, check in on you, and then leave, but he's daily having experience with us. And I, I, I know it sounds cliche, but whenever you understand that, when, whenever you delve into the depth of what the shepherd was living on a regular basis, the, the constant care and the intention of the shepherd was all about the sheep. And that's exactly the way he is. He is all about us. All about us. Stand with me today. In the, in the livestock industry, um, the shepherd doesn't give the animal a choice as to whether or not to stay with the flock. You stay with the flock. You have to be there. Uh, if you're the sheep, if you're the cow or whatever. But the Lord realizes in his wisdom that we are not farm animals and that we do have a choice. And he gives us that choice. He does not force us to stay with the herd, so to speak. But on the regular, while he's not forcing or coercing us, he is always reaching for us. So as we wrap up, I want you to give thanks for the Lord and all he's provided for you. Commit yourself to him, but also thank him for always reaching for you. Always reaching with his arms open for you. And providing us the love that we can't find anywhere else. Lord Jesus, I thank you tonight for all that you have given to us. Lord, you've been so kind and generous. Lord, you have given abundantly into our, into our lives. Lord, we acknowledge it. Lord, we recognize it. Lord, we thank you for it today. All of your blessings. Lord, the material things, the physical Lord, the spiritual blessings of your salvation, your peace, your goodness. Lord, we commit to you, Lord Jesus, to, to serve you. We commit to, to, to listen to your voice. I'm so grateful that you have continually reached out to me. Lord, you haven't left us. You haven't left us comfortless. You haven't left us alone. Lord, you're always reaching out to us closer than a brother. So grateful for your touch in our lives. Lord, we give you praise and glory today. I ask you to bring us back together again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. All right, God bless you for being in Bible study. We'll see you this weekend for service.